We've been talking for several weeks about different, different individuals who are around Jesus and their testimonies about Jesus. But today I want to go a little bit different direction than that. This is going to be more the story of one person's encounter with Jesus because it is such a profound encounter and such a transformational encounter that, uh, th that it affects everything from that point forward. So many testimonies this individual will give about Jesus going on from here. But I want to talk about this moment. And, and we're going to be talking about the Apostle Paul. Now, the point where we're going to start today is in Acts chapter 26. And at this point, now this is well into the story. And this is Paul recalling his experience of his encounter and telling the story. Well, why is he telling the story? He's telling the story because right now he's a prisoner. You see, he went up to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem he got uh, in trouble with the Jews. Uh, there were some Jews there from the province of Asia. They said, here's the man that's teaching in all these other places in the world. He gets seized. He ends up in Roman control. And they take him away from Jerusalem because the, the Jews were wanting to kill him there. And he's in Caesarea and he's been there for a long time. And there's a new governor there. Governor Festus has come. He doesn't know everything about this situation because it all started with Governor Felix. But Governor Festus is there and Herod Agrippa, who is the king. Now that term is, is used kind of in an unusual way because uh, throughout the the Roman territory that they controlled. Some areas had governors, some areas had kings, if you will. And uh, this particular area uh, around Israel, there was a, a part where the governors were in charge and a part where, where kings in the line of Herod were in charge. So Herod Agrippa has come and Festus is there and they bring Paul in to talk to him to have Paul explain why he's there and why he's made this appeal to the emperor. So I want to pick up the story here in Acts chapter 26, verse 9. This is Paul talking, and he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul was convinced early on that God's purpose for his life was to oppose those teaching about Jesus. We go on, verse 10. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, this is remarkable wording here, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So Paul is owning up to the reality that he was intensely opposed to Jesus. And in fact, was key to many who believed in Jesus being persecuted. Verse 12, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. Now, I want you to imagine that scene for a moment. He's traveling. It's midday. Already it feels bright outside. You've been out on a, on a bright day, and the sun is bright. You can't look in that direction. But so bright was this light that came upon Saul. He's called Saul at this point and blazing around him that it seemed brighter than the sun. So if you can imagine that scene for just a moment as you're traveling along, and suddenly here is this, this bright light, brighter than the sun. Verse 14, We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, there are some different interpretations as to exactly what a goad was, but we don't tend to know what that is. We know that term, to be goaded into something, but we don't necessarily know where it comes from. Well, specifically, mostly when the word goad is used, it's related to what was called an ox goad. Now, an ox was used as a, as a, 
as a beast for pulling things. And you know, an ox, they're huge, they're very big, and uh, they don't really adjust their course with gentle persuasion. So the driver of the ox, whether the ox was plowing or pulling a load or whatever, would go along with a sharp stick, almost almost like a spear, if you will. Very often they had a metal point on the end of them because the ox had a very thick hide. And to get the ox to go forward or to get him to turn another direction, the driver would poke the ox with the sharp end of this stick or, or this uh, goad, it was called. And, you know, the ox didn't like that, so he would change direction or go somewhere else. Well, every now and then you would have what we might call an ornery ox who didn't like to do what he was told when he was poked. And, and he would push against it or even sometimes kick against the goad. And the only thing that really came of that was it hurt more. So, so in this moment, we hear these words, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? So in this moment, Saul is overwhelmed. And he says, who are you, Lord? And here's the answer. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now, get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes. There's, there's an irony in this right here, and we'll get to this in a second. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So there's a lot contained in this, in this message. I am Jesus, the voice says. Now get up because... Anytime we encounter God in His glory, and we're going to talk about this a little more next Sabbath, anytime we encounter God in His glory, the light is overwhelming and we fall to the ground. And that's exactly what happens to Saul here. Saul here. So Jesus says, get up, because you're about to be commissioned. And here's your commission, Saul. You're going to be a servant and you're going to be a witness. And you're going to witness to what you've seen. So that means everything that's happened in his life so far, including this moment. And what you will be shown. Now this is an interesting point. Because sometimes God puts his commission upon us long before he gives us all the information. And the call is to receive that commission when it comes. Because there are the things that we've been shown so far. But then there are the things that the Lord has yet to reveal. And we will only get those when we need them at the right time. So, so the call is coming, but there is so much more that Saul will need to learn. Now, you get a sense here, this is going to be a dangerous mission. Because Jesus goes on to say, I'm going to rescue you from the Jews and from the Gentiles. And your purpose will be to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light from Satan to God, so that two things can happen. So that they can receive forgiveness of sin, and that they can take their place amongst the believers. So this is the mission. This is what Jesus has given Saul to do. And he'll later on be called Paul. And we'll, uh, we'll probably use those names interchangeably here because I'll, I'll lose track of which I'm saying. But no, if I say Saul, Saul or Paul, I'm talking about the same guy here. So here's the reality. If we were to look at Paul's life, he would get demerits for initially getting it wrong. Now, I don't know what his interaction was, whether he saw Jesus when he was... Uh, on earth. He doesn't seem to ever refer to that. He refers to this event. Yet he was in Jerusalem and he knows all about, uh, all about Jesus and this movement called the way because he's opposing it. He gets demerits for getting it wrong at first. And just for the sake of saying it, sometimes we get stuff wrong at first. 
I get stuff wrong at first. You get stuff wrong at first. And it's not good, and it's, you know, not best. But here's the thing about Paul. He gets praise for getting it right after Jesus calls him. We all have demerits from getting it wrong at first. But do we get it right after Jesus calls? I want to take you to another place where this story is told. It's told for the first time in Acts chapter 9. Now, what we're reading in Acts chapter 26 is Paul later in life telling the story. Acts chapter 9 is actually the chronological point at which the story takes place, as we're just getting to know Saul. And I want to go there, and I want to read you from Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 3. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now what's interesting in this telling is there's a lot less detail reported here in what Jesus said than what Saul will tell when he tells the story himself in chapter 26. And, and as I've reflected on that, I, I can think of a couple reasons that that might be. First of all, it may be that that initial counter actually, encounter actually was more brief, like it says here, and that the main point was get up, go into the city, and I'll tell you what to do. And it was over that span of three days while Saul was blind that the rest of this, that God gave him the rest of his purpose, the rest of his mission. It's amazing how sometimes a disruption can bring clarity. So here's Saul. He's living his life. He's sure he's doing what God wants. He's persecuting the church. He's going against anyone who says they're Christian. Until this disruption to his life knocks him down and he's blind for three days. In the midst of these three days, his life goes through a transformation. It's amazing what can happen in a disruption and how a disruption can bring clarity. And I think maybe you know perhaps what I might be referring to here. Are any of you living a disruption right now? Has it brought clarity? I've gained some clarity on some things over the last month and a half or so. Some of the, some of the, the routines and things that I thought were essential versus the things that really are. It's made me rethink some things about my life. And the interesting reality here is blind Saul ends up being able to see way more than seeing Saul ever saw. You see, in his three days of blindness, he comes to realize the reality about Jesus. All of his years before that, when he could see, he was blind. And that's what it makes interesting, the words that, that Jesus says to him, you will make the blind to see. And as an illustration of that, he goes through the experience himself. He is blinded for three days. But it is at this point that we get another player introduced to this story. And this is something that I've learned that God likes to do. He's done it with my life and he's done it in my life. And that is, he likes to use another person to play a role in coming into our lives and impacting us at these key moments in a way that takes us to the next level. God likes to use us in each other's lives. But here's the thing. In order for God to use us in someone else's life, we have to obey his voice and we have to do it the first time. We have to do it right then. When the goad comes, when we feel the goad of the Holy Spirit, 
We have to act or else the moment is gone. So another player comes into this story. So we continue on, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Okay, that's simple enough, right? The instructions are clear. Ananias has heard the Lord. It's all simple enough, except verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Have you ever been tempted to wonder if the Lord got it wrong? Has the Lord ever goaded you, prodded you to do something? But you're pretty sure that has to be wrong? It can be tough sometimes, right? Because there are plenty of examples of people who claim to go out in the name of the Lord and did atrocious things. And it gives us pause. And in this moment, Ananias is a little curious as to why the Lord would be sending him there, particularly since this is the guy in charge of making sure people like Ananias get persecuted. Verse 15, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Those are strong words, aren't they? It suggests that to be one of the greats, one of the ones who really accomplishes great things for God's kingdom, sometimes brings with it the reality of suffering, that you will go through loss. So what did Ananias do? The Lord comes to him, says, go help this guy. He's like, I don't know. This is not a good guy. God says, go. I'm telling you to go. He's important. I have a role for him. Your role is to go and pray for him. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. That's what I love about this story, about Ananias. Immediate obedience. He asked the question. He said, no, nah, not sure. God said, no, trust me, go. He went. He went immediately. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. You've heard that saying. We still use it to this day. The scales fell from his eyes. This is where it comes from. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias gets a lot of credit with me because he didn't waste any time kicking against the goats. He asked one question, God was clear, he went. So let me ask you this question. Do you believe that God leads his people? Do you believe that God leads us? We just kind of out here on our own? This is kind of an interesting question and it, it's received differently by different people. I think our our personality types plays into this a lot. There, there are those people who are constantly feeling led by the Lord. And then there are the others who aren't really sure if they've ever been led by the Lord or not. But it's pretty clear from Scripture that the Lord does lead in our lives. And, and usually, if we'll be honest, if we'll stop every now and then and look behind us at the road that the Lord has led us down, we'll see those places where the Lord led us, even if we weren't sure. Do you believe God leads his people? So let me follow that up. Let's say you do believe it. Do you let God lead you? Ah, that's another question, isn't it? 
It's one thing to ask the question hypothetically, whether or not God leads people. It's another thing to ask the question, when I sense God's clear leading, do I follow or do I kick against the goad? I got to tell you, mine is a mixed record on this. I've got some points in my life where, where yeah, I, it looks like I followed that leading pretty good. For example, I used to be a chemical engineer. And then I felt like God was leading me. I felt the goad to dump that, go to seminary, and become a pastor. I, I, I got that one right. I, I, I felt the goad. I moved. I did it. I took the action. Yet here's the irony. Since I've become a pastor, there have been examples of times where I have resisted the leading. You see, I'm not always easily led. It's been interesting to me throughout my life as I've looked at my life, the times where, where there was a sense of God clearly leading me in a way I understood. There are also the times when he led what I didn't even know he was leading. But as I was reflecting on this and trying to come up with a, a time in my life that, that really went along with this. It's really kind of interesting. The, the story that came to my mind actually happened when I was attending the University of Tennessee and studying to be a chemical engineer. And this was a point in my life where, where you would not have classified me as uh, someone who one day was going to be a pastor. I just was not engaged in church. I wasn't really going to church. I was I was in the scenario that a lot of young adults fall into. All of the framework that had been around me, that had channeled me in these, in these uh, certain ways of behaving and, and ways of thinking and attending church and different things, had been removed. And as they were removed, I found that those were not necessarily initiators that were coming up from inside of me. And I... I fell away from a lot of those behaviors and took on some others that were not healthy. But there was an interesting event that took place. And as I've reflected over, on it over the years, it, it seems to me as though it was an intervention from the Lord in the midst of that time, even during a time when I was not listening for his voice or looking for him. And the way it came about was, as I was at the university and, and engaging in different things at the university, after I'd been there a couple years, uh, myself and some friends of mine decided that we would go on the week where you go to, they called it Rush the Fraternities. We would go over there and just see what was going on in these places. And what it is, it's really the recruitment week. And you go in there and you talk like you're real important to everybody and they decide if they like you and they give you an invitation to join the fraternity. And I thought it was kind of a joke and I didn't really think it would go anywhere. But I, I went to one of the fraternities that in my mind was really one of the best ones on the campus. It was the Sigma Chi fraternity. And so I went there and I hung out and boy, I felt like an idiot. But, you know, you just hang out and you talk about yourself and stuff like this. And uh, for whatever reason, by the end of the week, they had decided they were going to invite me to join. So I got my invitation. They take you up into a little room and they, they talk to you and they say, we'd like you. And you say, OK, sure, I will pledge. And, uh, and then when it's over, then you, you join the pledge class and you have to do all of these things. And so I joined that. And, and I remember I, I, was, I was trying to participate and trying to do the things and, and going along. And, and I was beginning to see how in this group there was a new reality that I could have, well, I might have called it found myself in. But I really, as I reflect on it, think maybe a reality I would have lost myself in. I continued to participate, but there was a growing sense inside of myself that somehow I was crossing a line I wasn't supposed to be crossing. Now, I don't know how it is for anybody else's life, and I'm not trying to make a definitive statement here. I'm just telling you my story. And I remember one day I was laying on my bed. It was a bunk. I was on the top. I was laying on the bed, and I had the little book that they'd given you that we we're supposed to study and go through. And it felt as though 
the Lord came and spoke to me, which is very strange for me to say because there was no point, nothing at that point in my life where I was paying any attention to the Lord at all, and said to me, no, you will not do this. And it was so strong, the, the point of the goad was so sharp that I literally said out loud, fine, I won't do it. And I didn't. I never went back. I don't know what would have been down that road for me. I don't know exactly what the Lord was closing. Because it's not like at that point my life transformed and suddenly I was an evangelist. I was not. It would be a number of years of, of many stories and many different people in my life that would lead me to the point where I would quit being an engineer and become a pastor. But that moment was, was real. And, and I rejoice that in that moment I let God lead me, even though that was not really how my brain was even working at the time. But I want to bring the question back to you again. Will you let God lead you? Psalm 139, verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you believe that God leads us in the way everlasting? Do you believe that when you feel the goad, the reason for it is not to make your life miserable, but rather to get you in the right direction, in the way everlasting. It's how it reads here. Let me give you the epilogue in the story that Paul tells in Acts 26. Acts 26, verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. The epilogue to Paul's encounter was obedience to the goad. Once he understood where the Lord was leading him. Now here's the thing. Paul lost everything that he thought mattered by going the way that God sent him. He was a person of standing within the whole community. He was, he was vested with great responsibility. He lost all of that. Yet when you read the whole story, he gained so much more than he lost. This is what obedience to the goading of the Lord brings. You may well lose what you think matters most, but you will gain so much more than you lose. Is God goading you today? Maybe you're like Ananias, you know the voice of God well, and, and you have sensed his, his leading, maybe you even like that word better. And you're quick. Your obedience is quick. You go down that road. Maybe you're Saul and you had a transformational moment with the Lord. Or maybe your moment is still to come. As I reflected on this idea of how, how God might be goading us today, a few things came to my mind. One of those was, is God goading you to be more of a contributor to this community? any number of ways, your, your time, your energy, your talents, but also your resources. And I'm, I'm not making the offering appeal right now. I'm gonna make, that'll be a little bit later. I'm not making the offering appeal right now. I'm not, I'm not asking, is God goading you to give on the basis of the church's need? I'm asking you, is God goading you this direction on the basis of your well-being? Because if He is goading you down this road, it's because there's a reason. And it's because what you will find in faithfulness will be so much richer than what you've known holding everything to yourself.
What else? Is, is God goading you to finally establish a, a dependable, continuous, daily Bible reading plan? Something that you will maintain? He's not doing it because somehow by doing this you will suffer and be miserable. He's doing it because this will become part of the richest part of your entire experience with him. Is he goading you to end a destructive relationship? Is there someone in your life that really is just creating trouble for you, but you just can't stop? Maybe he's goading you to forgive when what you want most is to hang on to anger. The only reason he would do that is because if you will do what he's saying, if you will go in the direction he's leading, you will find so much more joy. Maybe he's goading you to love your family more. Your eyes have been somewhere else. You're focused on other things. Maybe he's saying, bring it back in. Look around this room. You're gathered in this room. If everything else is taken away, these are your people. These are the people you love. Maybe he's goading you to exercise. He got me on that one this year. Uh, he used uh, my son Gable as the means to achieve his end. And uh, we've kept going. We didn't let all of this craziness going on stop us. We're still going. Is he goading you to do that? Or maybe it's more fundamental. Is he goading you to stop pretending to be Christian and really be one? Not just going through the motions. Not just participating because it's fun. Not just coming for the music. But engaging. finally giving it all over. I want to go back to this passage in Psalm 139. And I want us to be uncomfortable for a moment. Because this, these words, verse 23, Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. My prayer right now all of us, wherever we are right now, is that we are wide open right now and God, by means of the Holy Spirit, is searching our hearts. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Do you have anxious thoughts? See if there is any offensive way in me. I'm going to pray this right now. Let's pray for a moment. Father, right now, by your Holy Spirit, search our hearts. See our reality, the lies that no one knows, the hidden things. Look upon it all and know the fullness of our reality. And then with your goad of love, lead us down an everlasting road. Lord, where are we resisting you? Where are we kicking against your goad? Where are we pushing back? What is it we know right now? Right now, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us victory. Give us the desire to follow the way you lead. Give us insight and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, God has seen you. He knows all. He has seen all. He still loves you. His Holy Spirit has never been any closer. Repent of those things. Stop kicking against the Lord. Maybe this is your day to finally really become fully a part of the church of Jesus Christ. 
Give it all to Him today. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May that be our prayer. God promises to lead us. Let's trust Him and go where He leads.